All right, good morning for those of you who are joining us. Um, I have 11.59, so I am going to go ahead and kind of give you a little intro, house cleaning stuff out of the way so that Yolanda and Allison can have as much time to give you their information and answer any questions that you might have. Um, my name is Christy Balraj. I am the region, one of the regional coordinators for Partners Resource Network. We're the Parent Training and Information Center for the state of Texas. We here as regional coordinators are here to help you navigate the school system if you're having um, problems or concerns with what's going on in the school with regards to your child with disabilities. Allison and Yolanda are gonna be talking about um, you know, uh, insurance and medical expenses, but I wanted to let you know that we do help with the uh, school side of it. We have re uh, regional coordinators all over the state, so you can reach out to me and I can get you in contact with someone in your area if needed. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, please, if you have questions specifically for Allison or Yolanda, put those in the Q&A for me, please. Um, I know you uh, as pan, um, attendees sometimes like to chat back and forth, which is fine. But if you have questions specifically for Allison or Yolanda, put those in the Q&A and I will make sure that I get to as many of them as possible. At the end of the webinar, I always send the questions to our presenters so that they can reach out to the people whose questions we didn't get to to provide answers. Um, we will also be sending you a link for the recording. And as always, I'm assuming Allison and Yolanda will be sharing their slide deck with us so that we can get that out to you guys. Um, and then at the end of the webinar, we will be launching a poll. So that's the evaluation for the webinar. So we appreciate any feedback that you might give us with regards to that. And so I am going to be quiet now and turn this over to Allison and Yolanda, let them introduce themselves and let them get started. It's all, it's all yours, ladies. Thanks so much, Christy. It's a pleasure uh, to be back with both of you uh, today. So um, today um, we are talking about a subject that I know is near and dear to my heart. I know it's near and dear to Yolanda's heart. Um, I would, I, I think, um, kind of talking about medical bills, medical debt, um, how do we navigate some of this? What are some over around it through things to think about? Um, and this is something that as families with with um, special needs kids that we've got to think about. Some of our kids have complex medical care needs uh, and the bills mount up quickly. Sometimes there's long hospital stays, multiple surgeries, scans all the time, things like that. And it really, really adds up. So Allison Scalberg here at Consolidated Planning Group, um, we are a holistic special needs planning firm. Uh, we do webinars on a regular basis, so if you have attended before, welcome back. We're glad you're here. Um, and if this is your first time, uh, just know that we have well over 100 uh, webinars on our Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel, and all of those webinars are geared to special needs families, transition, guardianship, special needs trust, SSI. It just goes on and on and on the topic. Uh, and the reason we put these out there is because it is hard. Life is tough. And all the stuff that we're supposed to know about these things, it's, um, it, it's oftentimes, um, it, it's just a little bit overwhelming, uh, the information, information overload or lack of um, solid, good information out there to help us navigate this journey. So that, that is why we're here, what we do. We're nationally certified as Social Security Advisors and members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. And we help families just like yours uh, you know, determine and create future care cost estimates for our loved ones that are going to have care needs long after we're gone from this earth. So um, if you need help with that, certainly reach out. We've got our contact information uh, in the chat box. And so um, I'll start just a, a little bit uh, about, you know, my journey. I'm a mom uh, to four. I've got two kids with special needs. And um, we've done a lot of ad advocacy in the past, like uh, Yolanda, as it relates to uh, medical bills and advocacy and kind of figuring things out with this. Because um, when there's multiple insurance in, in play, when you've got Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance, Obamacare, whatever you've got going on, um, it can be pretty confusing. You can be getting um, 
big denials in the mail. I, I, I think that that's what drove me and Yolanda and I have talked about that before drove me towards um, medical bill advocacy is because um, when one of my kids was first diagnosed, I mean, right after, you know, a, an, a long ICU stay and a long hospital stay, um, we got two giant packets in the mail with uh, $250,000 in bills that weren't covered by our insurance. Talk about wanting to have a heart attack. You're like, oh my goodness, like how, how does this even happen? So, um, you know, with a lot of um, a, a lot of determination, you know, we were able to to, to navigate those, get them fixed. They were, there were there were a lot of errors that happen in this field. It's important to look at things, and Yolanda is going to talk about um, what we need to know, what we need to do, and how we need to do it so we can keep this under control, keep this off of a, a negative ding on, on on people's credit reports and things like that. So, um, having said that, uh, Yolanda, I'm going to turn everything over to you. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you for inviting me again. It's always a pleasure talking with you and uh, members of your audience. So my name again is Yolanda Baker. I am quite a few things. <laughs> I'm an accountant. I'm an author. Um, but I am also a special needs mom. I have uh, three beautiful children. The eldest is on the uh, autism spectrum. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about uh, the history, what came before uh, I started this path and hopefully how I can help you all on this. Next slide, please. So here's a little disclaimer. You know, I'm not a financial advisor, even though I'm an accountant, I have a taxation background. Um, I would like this webinar today, today to be more like a uh, one special needs parent to another talking to each other one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so please don't uh, think of any of this as financial advice on my part. Next slide, please. Again, I'm an accountant. I'm also an author. I'm also a, uh, what they call a blockchain developer. And I am the founder of Curative Finance. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Next slide. So I'm gonna begin with this story. This is my son at about, I'd say about uh, 16 months. And, um, so we had just uh, moved to Austin from Los Angeles and uh, we didn't notice anything unusual about our son or any sort of uh, issues with our son uh, when we moved here. Uh, but very soon after, if you go to the next slide, very soon after um, he was diagnosed with autism at 18 months. And so at that point we did, my husband and I did everything we could. Uh, we went to various specialists put him on a medical diet. Eventually we took him to a special needs school. Uh, we went to every sort of therapist you could think of. And we even delved into um, holistic alternative treatments at that point. Uh, next slide. This is one of my favorite pictures of him. Everything was going as planned until, next slide. The insurance denied almost all our claims. And um, so my husband and I, um, we've never had to deal with the health insurance industry before. We were both generally healthy. And so um, for us to receive these denial of claims that we thought were legitimate were a bit of a shock, um, but we continued on with the therapy um, in spite of the denials. Uh, we did at one point use credit cards, took out a small personal loan because I did not want my son's therapy to stop just because the insurance uh, would not cover it. And so, my husband and I fought with the insurer. It was a good um, several year long fight. And uh, eventually we did get uh, some of the denial claims resolved. Um, next slide, please. So from this struggle, um, along with my background in taxation, reading the uh, US tax code, talking with many special needs families in the Austin area and beyond, I decided to write a book about my experiences called the Families, uh, Smart Families Guide to Healthcare Savings. And this is within the book is something I call the bite method. And you can go to the next slide. So um, we're looking to the past to prove the present. And what I mean by that is, is that every time I listen, television, online, the radio, the financial experts always focus on the future, your retirement. 
And I never could find anyone to help me with right now, my finances right now. Of course, there's budgeting shows and there's tips on that, but I wanted something more holistic. And so next slide, please. So what I did was I created something called the Bite Your Bill system. Now, the um, within the system, there's nothing unique about it. I did not create a budget. I did not create health insurance or taxes or employer sponsored health plans, but the way I created the system, which if used optimally throughout the year, can help you save on medical expenses. And BITE is an acronym, budget, insurance, specifically health insurance, T for taxes, and employer sponsored health plans, which are HSAs, FSAs, and other cafeteria plans. Next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about each one. So the first one is budgeting. And so in my book, I talk about budgeting. It's kind of like going on a diet. You're really excited at first. You can't wait to delve into it. And then about a couple of weeks, you kind of slack off and then you forget about it and you go back to your old ways. So my advice is, is that if you have a budgeting plan in place already, stick with it. You know, whether it's Dave Ramsey and the envelope system or Susie Orman or anyone else, if you have a plan, if you have your own method, stick with it and improve upon it. Um, there are a few things though that I would suggest that you do. Um, what I did early on um, in the diagnosis was I created a checking account for my son's medical expenses. And that checking account was only used for um, depositing money for his future expenses and withdrawing money for his expenses. I did nothing else. Um, and that really helped when tax time came along and I was able to deduct those expenses, which in the beginning were quite a few. And so uh, I would suggest if you all did that. Now, Allison did mention in a previous webinar uh, about ABLE accounts. And I would strongly suggest that you all look into that also. So uh, the next acronym, I for insurance, specifically health insurance, I dive into that um, in my book and in some of my other webinars, but I think the first thing you should do, this is probably, the health insurance part is probably the most stress-inducing of all the, the four that I talk about. And so if you become more knowledgeable in this portion, I think you become more empowered. And so you're able to help your, your child or your family out more. That's the way I felt once I got a hold on this. Now, I'm not an expert. I'll say that much. I'm not an expert in all things health insurance, but there were a few things that I did that really helped me out. And the first thing I did was I tried to understand the EOB, which is called the explanation of benefits. Um, back when my son was first diagnosed and we were receiving these EOBs, um, each health care insurer had a different style of, of the EOB which was actually quite confusing and a bit annoying. And now I believe with um, Obamacare, um, it has now, uh, there's now a structure to the EOB in which no matter which health insurer you go to, there's a certain structure to make it easy to read. And so my first suggestion is, is that if you're able to um, try to understand what the EOB is all about, because that's a great uh, stress reducer if you're able to. Um, the second thing is, is let's talk a little bit about your health insurance policy. Now, some, some people think that the policy is this really nice 20 page summary of, of the procedures and other things that can be covered, but that is not the entire um, policy. Sometimes it's known as certificate of coverage. There's other terms that are used, um, but it's usually anywhere between 75 to about 150 pages of your health insurance policy. And my advice is to read it, read through it. Um, some, you know, it might be a bit daunting at first, but once you understand some of the terms that are used within that certificate, um, hopefully it will help you understand more and you will feel more empowered once you read that through. And so the third thing is, it kind of ties in with the first two, is finding a medical claims advocate um, I would suggest finding someone, you can Google medical claims advocate. Um, they're also known as medical billing advocates. 
um, find someone, or perhaps you have a relative or family member who is um, knowledgeable in this, who can help you initially. But my suggestion is try to find an advocate that can help you through this, especially if you have complex medical conditions that are chronic. And also understand what claim denials are. Um, I think one of the things, the biggest learning curve I had was understanding the claims denials, how those worked, the various levels of denial and how you can, how you can fight those denials and hopefully um, get a win from them. Okay, so uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, Yolanda, no, let's no, talk no. about this for a second yeah, um, yeah. On, on the health insurance side. So, you know, a lot of families do have multiple coverage. And so typically the rule of thumb um, for anybody that's wondering is Medicaid is always the last payer. You can always look at Medicaid to be the last payer. So if you have um, group health insurance, your child's covered by the group health insurance, that's going to be first and Medicaid is going to be second. In the example that you have group health insurance, Medicaid and Medicare, typically the Medicare will be first, your group health insurance will be second and Medicaid will be third um, as far as, you know, payers go. So I, I just wanted to mention that sometimes if, if you have multiple group health plans, like maybe mom and dad both have a group health plan and the kid is covered on both of them. Uh, whichever one is going to be the primary, it may have to do with the person's date of birth, the parent's date of birth, and whoever's date of birth is first. They, you know, the insurance companies play some games on that. But sometimes, sometimes people think that you might be better off to have two group plans. And depending on the date of birth and which group plan is better than the other one, you may not be better off to, in, in that example. Um, and, and I would also say um, a couple of things on those EOBs. It used to be that they would mail these EOBs to you, the, um, the explanation of benefits. Now they're all online. So you do have to be intentional to look at these EOBs. There are mistakes on EOBs all the time. There are people you've never even heard of. There are procedures on there that didn't even happen. There are things that, that are out there. So you do have to kind of look at it. And then, you know, those EOBs are going to give you those details of exactly why things are being denied. Um, and, you know, there are definite ways, um, and, and we'll talk about this, but there are different, definite ways to appeal this. How, you know, a lot of families, you know, get a denial and they just, figure that they're never going to win against the insurance company, so they don't do anything about it. They don't appeal. They don't call the local doctor to get a letter of medical necessity uh, and appeal it with, with the letter of medical necessity. And there's a lot of things that you can do to essentially make this go away the right way to where you do not owe the money um, and, and you get the coverage that you deserve. Um, Yolanda, we did have a question. Um, it says, what about like everyday items the kids need, like pull-ups, wipes, baby foods? Um, can this account be used for, for these items? So an ABLE account, um, Yolanda mentioned that a, a moment ago, uh, an ABLE account is under the 529A for ABLE, <clears throat> IRS code. And basically, if an individual's disability started prior to age 26, you can have one. Uh, the money grows tax free, and if the what you pay out of the able account could be construed as achieving a better life for an individual with a disability, then you can pay for it out of an able account. So what that means to you is that what you can pay for out of an able account is very very broad. Um, so so any care needs for an individual. I mean, and and I you know to the extent of a vacation for an individual with a disability, an iPhone, adaptive equipment, uh, devices, computers, um, uh, therapy, out-of-pocket medical expenses. Uh, it, it's, I could go on and on uh, about the, you know, the broad things that you can um, pay for out of an ABLE account. So those are something to think about. And, and basically, we have whole presentations on ABLE accounts. But um, an ABLE account is a place that you can have money that won't count against you for SSI and Medicaid. A lot of families aren't getting SSI or Medicaid if their child is a minor. But when their child um, is 18 or over, it's based off of the child's assets, not the parents. 
so money in an able account will not count against them for those for those purposes um the total amount in an able account we have another question you can put sixteen thousand dollars a year into an able account in order to stay um ssi and medicaid eligible you never want that account to go over a hundred thousand dollars so technically, and I, I probably should check for 2022, an ABLE account as of last year could have up to $400,000 in it if you didn't care if you disqualified for, for SSI and Medicaid. So that is um, a, a great question. So I just wanted to mention those few things because a lot of times um, it is, um, it's pretty confusing and especially if you've got multiple payers going on and, and also, I, I know that this is a big issue for a lot of people. Um, some of the drugs that our kids are on are really, really expensive and Medicaid doesn't pay for them. And, you know, so we're trying to find, you know, unique ways to get those covered. And a lot of them aren't covered by our group insurance or they were last year and now this year they're not. Um, but again, those appeals um, and those letters of medical necessity from the doctors, you can get those meds covered. It just takes a little grit and a little intention and, uh, and a letter from the doctor, but you can definitely get those covered. Um, okay, um, we've got some more questions. Who determines which insurance company is primary group or Medicare? Um, so, so it, I, I, most of the time Medicare is going to be primary and then that group coverage is secondary. And so it, that is going to de de depend on your plan um, and, and how the plan document reads and what the plan document says. So there isn't a broad stroke. It is, it's, the broad stroke is usually Medicare is primary in that example and that your group health insurance is secondary. It's not 100% of the time. Um, so you do have to check with your, your group plan for that. Um, Yolanda, do you, do you have some additional, um, you know, things that you would want to mention on those? Actually, Allison, that was an awesome uh, response to that question. Um, you know, in regards to appealing denials, you know, I, I have encountered quite a few families who were so discouraged by the initial denial letter that they just gave up at that point and just accepted uh, the, the letter. And um, well, I'll talk about it right now um, with, the, uh, with the issue with uh, my husband and I uh, appealing these. Um, we actually fought up to the third level, which actually on and off, it was probably about a year worth of denials and then requesting information and then coming back and say, no, we believe this is covered. And then finally, um, yeah, it was about a year where we finally got uh, this procedure covered, which was a big victory for us because we felt that our son needed this particular type of therapy. And um, what we did was, I don't think there was anything extraordinary about, about us um, to get that. Uh, we just read the information, we read what was required um, to appeal. Uh, we got some help from other special needs families and from a med medical billing advocate. And eventually with a little patience and a little um, firmness, uh, we were able to get that covered. So that a, goes it, right into something that's in the chat box. I'm trying to get my daughter OT to help her learn to bathe and wash her hair. My insurance is saying no. We are in, um, in the appeal process with them right now. Do I have any rights to appeal anywhere else if they still still deny us? So again, I would say here is the, the that letter of medical necessity um, from the doctor is going to be an important component of the the appeal but let's you know in that example let's say that they are still denied then what would you do Yolanda? Well um, I have spoken with a few families who have gone to the various levels and were still denied at, at that point if you haven't done so already I would strongly suggest and we're going to talk about this in the upcoming slides um, aligning yourself with a medical billing advocate, there, there are always options. Um, it's, not, it's not final. Um, the medical billing advocate has years of experience dealing with situations like yours. And we're gonna talk later in the presentation, uh, the two most frequently asked questions uh, to me, such as what happens when my uh, claim is denied? Um, and so we'll talk about that. 
Um, but what I would suggest first is get a medical billing advocate on your side if, if you feel or if it has come to that level. I hope that helps. And then I'll explain it later in the presentation. And then one more question before we move on. Sure. Um, is there a time limit for submitting a claim to a provider? I reconciled manually uh, my manually submitted claims for 2021 against the EOBs and found several that were never paid. So I resubmitted. Now I'm wondering if I should go back into 2020 or further. Um, is that possible? Allison, I'm not certain about uh, the time limit because I think that may have changed recently. But I would say... Um, I would say regardless of whether you think there's a time limit, just do that. Um, just resubmit, um, check up on it, check on the status. I, I would also talk with a medical billing advocate again for this type of situation, because I think, I think it really depends on, I don't think it really depends on the health insurer, but I think it, well, I think it depends on what I would call their terms of service. It used to be two, um, like 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 physicians have like two or three years, and they may have changed that more recently to, so. to to file claims. Um, but I've had some old ones. In fact, I've got um, some claims that I have been on <laughs> for a year. Uh, they were all out of network, and I am uh, determined to get them paid. But some of the stuff that happened. Um, didn't necessarily have procedure codes. And so there were some issues with that. Um, but a lot of times, and also just know this too, um, if you have group health insurance and, and you're having a problem with the insurance company, don't forget to reach out to the HR, com your HR you know, back office. Let them know that you're having a problem because a lot of times they have a person in high places with the insurance company that can be very, very helpful in making things go away. So, so just don't forget that important step. It's a free step that you can take of reaching out to the HR um, for the company that's, you know, like your company. So if you work for Chevron, for instance, your HR at Chevron, I'm just giving an, an, an example, and, and they'll be in the know of, of who can help make things go away. But don't continuously beat your head against the wall with the insurance company without getting other people involved. So whether it's a medical claims advocate, whether it's file, don't delay filing the appeal, don't delay looking at your EOBs and, and paying attention to what is going on. Um, but there's definitely, definitely help out there for you. Yes, uh, ask for help. Um, this is something that uh, my husband and I could not have done alone. Uh, we, we received such great information and help, um, like I said before, from special needs families and from a billing advocate. They were all so helpful. I don't think we would have been able to get those uh, claims, those denied claims accepted if we didn't go that route. If we tried it on our own, I think we would have been overwhelmed and it wouldn't have worked out. One thing also I wanted to mention, and I know it's not mostly open enrollment season for your group health insurance right now, and it's not for individual health insurance either, but <clears throat> at open enrollment, choose your plans carefully because some people think, um, wow, you know, I have a kid that's pretty sick. I'm going to get the best insurance plan there is. Um, I'm going to get the most expensive one, the, 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 you know, the most grand plan that there is. And sometimes that plan is not the best plan for you. Um, a lot of times with kids that have chronic illness, sometimes those those um, those those you know kind of lower the lower tier one, the lower premium one, basically it might have a deductible of five or six thousand dollars. It basically doesn't pay much until you hit your deductible. But then as soon as you hit your deductible, it goes to a hundred percent. So like. I win every year because that's the plan that I take. I take the HSA account, I take the lower premium, but it also doesn't have co-pays. So if you've got a kid that's got chronic illness and you're going to see every doctor you see is a specialist and every time you go to the specialist, it's a $50 copay, $30 copay, et cetera. Um, for us, we were a lot better off to just take that deductible, maybe the higher deductible plan, the lower premium, and as soon as we hit the deductible, it's 100%. Well, guess what? We hit the deductible the first month. They lose on us every year. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so, so you got to do the math because the best plan is not always 
the best plan um, financially for you. I absolutely agree. Um, you know, depending on what your uh, depending on what company you're at, I, I would strongly suggest like the moment you're able to read the plans that are available. And um, if you need further clarification, talk with your HR department and try to see with your personal situation what insurance is best. Thank you again, Allison. That was great. Thank you for helping me with that. Um, we do have um, we do have um, a comment and a question. Yes. Um, there, there's a comment that says there's also a child only insurance plan, Blue Cross Blue Shield, if Michigan has one. Yes. Um, there's a lot of uh, child only plans in, in the state of Texas as well, um, so that they do exist. So if you um, needed to get um, insurance on the individual marketplace, um, one of the issues that um that we've seen with medicaid and autism is a lot of the aba and other therapies and things have historically not been covered so right. having other insurance coverage is definitely um def definitely needed has been needed and i haven't actually even heard i know it was on the chopping block or on, on the you know trying to get that approved to to where there there, there would be more therapy and um but so that, you know, that's something to consider. Um, another person said, how do you find a medical billing advocate? Um, how helpful are they helpful with Medicaid claims? I know as a firm that we do um, medical bill advocacy. Um, are there other places that you can recommend? We don't deal with Medicaid appeals. Um, that's not something that we, that we deal with. Um, how do you respond to that? Initially, with my husband and I, this was pre-Google. Well, maybe Google was around back then, but we did go online um, via Yahoo. We just typed in medical billing advocate, and from there, we were able to find somebody. Um, but also, we did talk with special other special needs families in um, online groups. Um, there was one particular Yahoo autism group that was just incredible and helped us so much. Um, but I will be talking about that in the next couple of slides. There's this one particular foundation that I find to be invaluable. So if you hold on, I will explain that um, just in a few minutes. And so, so let's go back to um, the third acronym letter, which is taxes. Now, I'm not gonna go too much into this because when I initially um, started this, at one point, uh, the AGI for taxes, the adjustable gross income, the threshold for your medical expenses was 7.5%. Um, now it is at 10%. And what that means is, is that unless you have just an incredible amount of medical expenses um, that you have paid out of pocket that were not reimbursed yet, unless you have a 10% threshold of that, for most families, that's out of the question. And so I'm not going to spend too much here on taxes. But the important thing is, is that if you do meet that 10% threshold, I would suggest that you keep all the receipts and that you organize them according to your comfort level. And I talk a little bit about that in my guidebook on how to do that. Um, I also uh, wanna mention that some uh, or most alternative medical expenses are deductible. And I explain that again in my guidebook. It's, little, it's a little bit detailed for this um, webinar. Um, but there are quite a few uh, medical expenses that can be covered if you want to use them for taxes. I just want to talk about that for a second because this is yes. something that comes up all the time. Um, and and I and is it ten percent of AGI or did it go back down to seven no, and a half? No, I understand. It's still stuck at ten. It was seven point okay. five for a while. Um, mm -hmm. I can confirm that. But the last time yeah. it was at ten. But you yeah, know, Allison, even at seven point five. For even for most special needs families, that's really just it's it's, it's, it's often case. high. It's off often high, and so you come in and basically you can't deduct your medical expenses. But on that note, before we move on from this, yes. because one question that we get all the time, Yolanda, is um, can I deduct my special needs school as a medical expense, and um, can I? deduct my nanny for um, a special, you know, for, for a medical expense. And, and I guess that there's rules on that, right? Like, yes. like if the met, if the nanny has nursing certifications or has some kind of certifications, right. Yes. Then that could be a medical expense. But if you just have a 
regular old caregiver at your house, then that's really not a medical expense. Is that correct? It depends. And it could be, I mean, you can even have someone who does not have any medical, um, formal medical experience. Someone say a nanny who's been caring for special needs children for years. Um, and somehow if you can get uh, documentation for that, um, showing that, I mean, it's, it's pretty, again, it's a little too detailed for this webinar, but there are ways around that legally that you can uh, put in uh, the expenses for a special needs caretaker, not necessarily a nanny. I wouldn't use that term. And again, this is not advice. This is just sure. one special. And, and then what about you know? what about the the special needs schools? Because you know right. a lot of these private schools right. are geared towards special needs. What do you think about right. that? You have any thought on that? Yes. And again, it depends. Um, I have read several uh, tax court cases in which certain um, expenses were deductible for certain schools. And then there was a case in which a gentleman had, um, a father had taken his son who had behavioral problems. He had taken him to, I believe, um, a military, uh, military type school. And the tax court had, um, had gone against the father because the, the type of, of education, the type of training the, that was there was not uh, therapy. And there was a lot of interesting details about that case, but depending on what the, the medical condition is, and if this uh, therapy or this school is trying to mitigate, treat, or cure a medical condition, it may be covered. And, and I'm sorry, I can't give you a straight yes or no. Sure, answer, sure, sure. But there are many cases where um, the particular type of school for a particular type of therapy either part or all of the, the schooling or therapy may be covered. And just as a side note, that's what happened to us personally. We were able to get our son into a special needs school. Initially, the insurance denied it, um, but we were able to prove that um, for the entire day, he was receiving therapy from licensed practitioners and we were able to get that covered. Yes, and I've actually seen some um, special needs schools in the greater Houston area that were actually covered by the health insurance. So that's another thought. Um, on keeping those receipts, just two little items I wanted to give there. Um, I suggest get yourself, you know, an, an eight and a half by 11 envelope and just say 2022 medical expenses. And every time you have a receipt, just throw it in that giant envelope. And at the end of the year, you can scan all of them. You have them all together. We do that for, for just um, like home improvements even. We have a home improvement one. We have a medical receipt one. Other things that you might um, you know gather. But that is one good way to keep them all together. Because if you're like most, if you don't have a system like that, you can't find all of them. It's a, it's a frustrating effort trying to find them all again. That's, that's a good, that's a good tip. And so um, I want to talk a little bit uh, about taxes here, th that what we mean by what is covered. And so if any of you are interested and you feel as if you're going to go above the threshold for this or next tax year, uh, what you could do is visit irs.gov and that's .gov, not .com and go search for IRS publication 502 which is medical and dental expenses. And what you'll find there is a listing, not an exhaustive list, but a pretty comprehensive list of most things that are deductible. And so the IRS has a, uh, a definition as to what is deductible, what is covered as a medical tax expense. And I'm gonna read the quote. It's the cost of diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease and the cost for treatments affecting any part or function of the body. It doesn't cover things like vitamins or just going on vacation because you're feeling a little sad. Uh, I'm being a bit, um, I'm, I'm trying not to be too uh, descriptive here, but there are certain things that you may feel are covered, but are not. And this is something that you might wanna talk with a CPA about or an EA about, about specific medical uh, tax expenses. Uh, what are covered. But I do talk a little bit about that in my guidebook that I have. Um, but it's a pretty exhaustive list as to what is covered. So, and I know that we have some do it yourself or um, tax, you know, people out there. And I, I guess I would say, um, 
and, and I'm married to an accountant, <laughs> um, we still have a professional that we use, right? So, yeah. um, and, and, and so I, I'm a, I am a fan of professional advice when it comes to that on, on, on these matters. When you have extensive medical claims, when you have a lot of moving parts, some of you might be business owners as well. There's a lot of different moving parts. And I would just say, unless you're really great and you're really a specialist at this, um, by hiring a professional, yes, you're going to pay for professional services, but probably what they're going to be able to do for you and find and, and handle, they're going to save you on that back end more than what you ever paid them. So it's kind of food for thought there. And we do have, um, we do have someone that we know that is really adept in working with special needs families as well. Yes. Yeah, so anyone who is uh, who believes that they're going to reach and go beyond the threshold, I would strongly encourage that you speak with a tax professional. And so I'll go briefly over this. Not every medical expense is deductible. And so I have a couple of, of, um, of questions that I tell myself. So is it is this treatment covered by that definition I just talked about? And also, do I have a prescription from a physician about the medical condition? And do I have the proper receipts or statements for that particular service? Um, there are other requirements, and, and I talk about that in the guidebook, um, but um, it's, it's a lot. Um, I know it's a lot to cover, especially with taxes. Um, but initially, if you were to get that initial diagnosis from the physician, and if you ask yourself this, those questions, are they covered? Um, then that's, that's a really good step um, to start with. And again, the, the tax professional, should be able to help you clarify those medical expenses if they're deductible or not. And so, yes, there are other requirements, but those are the first steps to get you empowered. At least that's the way I felt. Next slide. And this is something um, I, we can skip this. This is my really dry, corny sense of humor. I have a website called fakeTaxTips.com if you want to visit that later. But let's go to the final letter, which is E for employer sponsored health plans, which are HSAs, FSAs, and cafeteria accounts. So my advice is if you are enrolling in this, to please read your plan carefully. Actually, you are able to see this before you enroll in a particular health insurance plan. So I would suggest reading it, talking with your HR department, um, going over some details because HSAs are pretty incredible. Now, um, I would advise putting the maximum account amount that you can in that account. Um, and it depends. The HSA, what they can cover varies. And so I cannot tell you right now what particular services or procedures are covered, but every HSA that I've enrolled in with my the various health insurance plans we've had over the years, it's just been an excellent idea, I think. I think it, it helps tremendously. It helped tremendously with my family and the families that I've spoken to who have HSAs, they find it to be very uh, a very invaluable resource. So um, I would add to um, dependent care spending accounts. A lot of employers have a dependent care spending account. So if you have high uh, expenses, um, you know, such as a nanny or caregiver expenses or things like that, I do suggest that that dependent care spending account and, and maxing out that. With all of these HSAs, FSAs, dependent care spending accounts, what you need to check with um, if they're being offered is if there's money in them at the end of the year, do you, you do if you don't use it, do you lose it or does it roll over? Because some of them have some less than favorable wording of that if you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. We never had that problem. We always had far more medical expenses than what I could contribute to the account. But um, but you do want to just check on that uh, to see if, if there's a provision for that and make sure you spend it by the end of the year so you don't lose any of the money that you put in there. Right. Now, HSAs, those you can roll over to yes. infinity uh, practically. But uh, yes, please check because FSAs usually are use it or lose it scenarios and dependent care spending accounts might be the same. And so I have this testimony from a, uh, a friend of my husband's who had some, um, had some medical expense issues. I uh, didn't think that the holistic um, and other therapies weren't covered. I offered her my guidebook. She came back and she said, oh, I, 
got back several thousand dollars for my tax return. And when she told me that, I knew at that point, because I wasn't certain whether it would work for a lot of people. Um, but um, our friend Brooke, there's nothing unusual about her family. You know, they're not multimillionaires. They, they do work um, nine to five W-2 jobs. And so I knew at that point, once I found out from Brooke that it actually helped her um, with getting that tax refund, I knew that this system worked and it was something I was really happy about and proud of. And next slide, please. So again, I could go into details, but probably take about five hours and you'd probably end up like this. <laughs> it's a good cure for insomnia. I originally had 700 pages of the book, but I did whittle it down to 150. So hopefully that's not too bad. So let's go over the top, the two top frequently asked questions. And so this goes um, from the previous questions that we had, hopefully this will answer it. So the first one is my health insurer denied my healthcare claim. What do I do now? The second one is what if I can't pay a medical bill? Um, so next slide, please. Okay, now this is, this is something I would suggest all of you take a look at whether or not you're having issues with any sort of healthcare claims. Um, I found this to be an invaluable resource when I was first starting off on this journey. And I believe this should answer the question to the person who talked about um, denial of healthcare claims, about Medicare uh, denials. This is patientadvocate.org. This is the Patient Advocate Foundation. Um, and I found it above all others, all other um, advocacy groups that I found online, I found them to be the go-to source. Um, they are a wealth of information. Um, they got me on the right path. And um, I feel as if they were just an invaluable resource to help my husband and I get these denied claims approved. And Allison, did you have a question? Or? Yeah, no, I think that they're great too. I just want you guys to know that depending on your child's diagnosis, there might be trials out there. There might be other programs or studies, big research studies that are largely funded that your child could be, become a part of and have you know um, some of their um, needs met or coverage for things that maybe you wouldn't have had um, coverage for. Another thing that I also wanted to mention, too, is that um, from a drug perspective, because, again, I know some of these drugs are crazy. I mean, I, I've I've had one client that the, the drugs for their child was over one hundred thousand dollars a month. Right. So having, you know, coverage was super important. But when it is denied and you've appealed that drug and you've got a letter of medical necessity and it is still denied, there are other programs through the manufacturer of the drug company. So you've got to go to the drug company website and find out what programs they have available out there. There's a lot of ways um, around and a ways to get coverage for those drugs and also working, you know, with the physician, obviously, if there is a, an, an alternative or other things. Um, but there's a lot of ways around that, too. But Patient Advocate Foundation, they are fabulous and you can get a lot of information out there. Um, we had one question. It was a while back. Um, as far as the medical claims advocate, do you do you pay for this? So you don't pay for the Patient Advocate Foundation, but if you hire a medical you know claims advocate, typically, um, typically, what does that cost, Yolanda? I mean, how to how really how would depends. I? It really depends. Um, usually, and these are the medical advocates that I've spoken to. They usually do not charge up front. They charge after uh, the bill has been resolved. And they usually take a percentage of either, well, it depends. They usually take a percentage of the savings that they give you. Some of them do take a percentage of the total bill. And those advocates I usually don't um, hire or recommend um, because some of these bills can be in the tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so um, usually the billing advocate that we work with that, uh, that I work with or my families work with, um, they usually take the fee after everything's been settled. And again, that's a percentage. I can't tell you the exact percentage because it has been a few years since I've talked with the, or worked with the medical billing advocate, but it doesn't hurt to ask. You tell them what their fees are up front before choosing them, but that's usually 
how that worked in my situation and in most of the families that I helped. They don't ask for money. And, and also the Patient Advocate Foundation may be able to make a referral in yes. your local area. And they're probably going to make a solid referral of somebody that's not going to rake you over the coals. So right. they're not going to have an affiliation with somebody that um, is not trustworthy. So that would be a good place uh, to find um, a good solid advocate as well. Right. I, I'm, that's why I would suggest um, probably starting off with patientadvocate.org website first if you feel like you're gonna be a bit overwhelmed. So uh, the next question that I get is, well, what if I can't pay a medical bill? And so my question always is, is that what do you do with the medical bill? Let's not talk about payment first. Let's figure out by opening up the envelope and reading it or online, reading it as soon as possible, the, the EOB or the statement and figuring out, hey, this doesn't look right. Or even if it does look right, contact the billing department, confirm, the charges. And even then, you, you're not there to pay for it. Um, I, I would not do that. You, you need to have certain um, things done before you can sit down and say, okay, this is how much we owe. Um, so uh, I would suggest doing that before even thinking about paying for a medical bill. Um, if you need additional help, contact the, the Patient Advocate Foundation. And we did touch upon this earlier, you know, um, talking with the health insurer, um, making sure that the, the the codes are correct, the services are correct, um, making sure that everyone was in network. Why is the bill so high? Just figure out as much as you can about the services that you received. I want to I want to talk a little bit about billing departments and calling hospitals. Yes. It's a little bit different when you're calling local local um, medical offices like the doctor's office, but hospitals and facilities, there's a couple of things that you sh should know. What if you can pay the medical bill? What if this bill's $10,000, $5,000 and you can? I have historically been a fan of doing the monthly payments because most I have seen in the last year, I've seen some hospitals, not in the state, charge interest. But most hospitals on their billing, they don't charge interest. So there's a couple of myths out there that you have to know. Number one, you hear around the water cooler, as long as you pay them something, they can't send it to the to the creditors. That is not true. The, the truth is that they have to agree to the payment plan. And if you have a payment plan with them, and as long as you're fulfilling the terms of the payment plan that you agreed to and they agreed to, then that is correct. They will not send you to the creditor. So that's one thing. So when she says open and read those bills ASAP, that is really important because a lot of times what people do, people are feeling frustrated. They're overwhelmed. They got a lot going on personally, which is why they have these medical bills. And so they put these on the shelf of something that they're going to get to later, or I can't even deal with this. I just can't right now. Um, and, and then before you know it, it's going to um, a credit, you know, a creditor. So, you know, you don't really want, um, you know, a credit recovery agency on your back. And so you want to keep these bills with the hospital, um, not, you know, with the, the credit the credit folks. Um, the second thing is, is when you call that number on that bill, there is um, certain levels of customer service that um, that you get, and usually it's you know your your first your your first stop is just the regular customer service, and you basically call and you say, listen, I've got this bill, and I need to get it set up uh, set up on a payment plan. I can't pay this bill all at once, and they say okay, and they're trained. They have training to tell you okay, you can pay this over one twelfth or 118th and every once in a blue moon they'll say okay we'll let you pay this off over two years depending on the threshold and then the amount of the bill um they only have so much that they can approve but it's okay for you to say and you should say next i appreciate that however i can't afford that either in fact i was thinking about a hundred dollars a month or fifty dollars a month whatever it is that you were thinking about um, and I'm going to need to get that approved. Could you escalate me to a supervisor so I can get that approved? They typically will esca escalate you. You typically will not talk to a supervisor right then. They'll put you in a queue. They'll call you back in 24 to 48 hours. But that's how you get it down into a payment plan that you can afford. So if your number is 20 bucks, it's 100 bucks. If it's 200 bucks, it doesn't matter. Whatever your number is, your number is. And don't be afraid to say, hey, look. 
I've got this bill and I've got um, 10 other bills with every other facility all across town too. And so I'm just, I don't want, you know, I'm a good person and I pay my bills and I don't want this to go against my credit. I've just got to set this up. So just understand, and, and we have um, wording um, for that. We can help you with that. And we actually even have letters. And here's the other important thing that you need to know. There is financial assistance applications available. Sometimes they're called charity care. Sometimes they're called financial assistance applications. They typically don't offer them. If you ask for them, they'll let you know about them. And, um, and go ahead and ask for one. It does not hurt to ask for one. Even if you say, oh my gosh, we make way too much money. There's no way uh, that they would do that because we've seen people that make way too much money where these bills were either, either canceled reduced by 50%. Um, and basically it's a, it's the power of telling your true story and you don't have to send a six page letter, but what happened? You know, why do you need help? Do you have bills all over town everywhere for hospitals? Uh, were you affected by hurricane Harvey? Has there been other, some other major financial event in your life? Somebody died, somebody became incapacitated, something happened. Um, tell your story because a lot of times you can get help that way, but ask for that application. Don't lie on the application, be honest and submit the documentation that they request. Um, and, and you have a real good probability of getting some help. Thank you, Allison, that, that's, that's what you have to do. And you know, it may be overwhelming, but again, there are people and organizations that are out there that can help you and you're not alone. And Many others have gone through the same thing you have, and successfully, I'm one of them. It was a multi-year process, um, but we, we got through it, and it was also educational, so that if this ever happens again, uh, we will have the tools and we have the notes to help us out in the future if we have to go through another um, denial process. So. For sure. You know, Yolanda, one other thing that I wanted to mention, so say you do have the financial capacity to pay that bill, you yes. don't necessarily want to drop that much money all at once. You'd rather pay the payments since they don't charge you interest. You can make more money on your money and pay them payments than, than dropping it all at once. But one little trick that you guys need to know is a lot of these billing departments aren't getting paid at all. And they have programs in place where um, you say, hey, what is the best price you'll take to cover this bill and, and, and call it good? Some of them will reduce the bill right on the spot for 50% if you'll pay it in full right then. Um, I have definitely seen 50%. I um, regularly see 25 or 30% reduction to the bill if you'll pay it right then. Um, so that is another question um, worth asking if, if, you know, if you are in a position to pay the bill that you could just just one simple question and there you have it, so. Well, um, I wanna thank each and every one of you for attending the webinar. I think we are under uh, the time limit, so I wanna thank all of you for uh, coming over and supporting us. If you have any questions, um, my email address is curativefinance at gmail.com and it's also in the Q&A, so thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. It's always great um, partnering with you and you, Christy, as well. Um, the things that we've got on the screen here are just some things that should be on your special needs planning radar. We do have other webinars on all of these topics. We have them that are coming up. Um, we do webinars every month, and we have past ones that, um, that are out there on the YouTube channel. So um, do check those out if any of those items or things that um, might be on your radar. Uh, we work on a collaborative team at Consolidated Planning Group, and I always just like people to have some faces with some names um, at our firm and so um, this is our contact information if, um, if if we can be of assistance to you in your journey um, you know whether it's on this topic or any number of the other topics that, that we work on um, certainly reach out to us our consultations are always free um, and today again um, everybody that has participated today they are going to get a copy of the slides um, and a recording of today's presentation. So if you need to go back and um, check anything or, or look at any of the, the links or anything like that, then they will certainly be out there. So um, thanks so much, Christy. We're gonna turn it back over to you and we got two minutes to spare. All right, well, Allison, it's always great having you guys here and Yolanda, I was glad to have you here. I don't have some of the medical issues and with insurance that you guys were discussing, but I actually learned something today about, you know, my own personal medical insurance and so forth. So I appreciated that. 
Um, Allison, since we've got a couple of minutes left, um, you're going to be back in May on letter of intent. Do you want to kind of give people a, a sneak peek of what that's going to be about? Because you'll be back here on May the 18th, I think. Yes, um, sure. Um, and then um, somebody asked if they can share our slides and our video from today with other special needs parents. Absolutely. Share our YouTube channel and then they can pick and choose what topics they uh, need to listen to. But so, yeah, our ne next topic is going to be on the letter of intent, why you need one, what is the letter of intent. And I like to call it a family love letter. Uh, so basically, as mom or dad, um, we typically, I, I, I say we have forgot more than anybody will ever know about our kids, right? And um, so, but what if we're not here? What if we're incapacitated? What if we can't talk? Do we have nonverbal kids that, you know, so this is basically a document that is everything to do about your child, their special needs, their needs, their background, everything that's been going on with them, all their diagnoses, their meds, and we're going to go over that and everybody who participates in that will get um, um, a PDF form fillable copy of our letter of intent so you don't have to create your own. It is 19 pages. <laughs> it is a lot, but you know what? Our kids are a lot, so um, so they need this. You know, they need this information. So do join us for that. Um, we'll be happy to be back with you uh, again for that. So thanks so much, everyone. I hope everybody has a great afternoon. And Take care. As we are winding up, if you will complete the workshop evaluation poll that I've launched, I would appreciate that. Um, and because you attended today, like Allison said, you'll be getting information from them, but you will also be receiving a um, link to our Facebook page here for the PACT project, where you can go back and see the workshop or see the recording there from today's uh, webinar or any of the ones that Allison has done for us in the past will be on our Facebook page. So you definitely have two places where you can go back and look. And ladies, I, like I said, I appreciate it. I learned uh, uh, several things today and I look forward to uh, collaborating with y'all again. <laughs> Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Take care, everyone. Have a good one. Thank you.